Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael Aoun Veor. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of hundreds available as free downloads, podcasts, or transcriptions. Our lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures to find teachings that suit you. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live and includes a free online classroom allowing listeners to see images, read related scriptures, and ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate, visit GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is a service of Glorian Publishing, a non-profit organization. The lectures and radio broadcast have been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. To make a donation, visit GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Moses, the Exodus, and the staff of Aaron. We are penetrating into the mysteries written in the five books of Moses which he left <coughs> for us to study in order to comprehend the manner in which we have to walk in this path of the self-realization of the being. In different lectures, we have explaining how Moses relate to willpower and how through him we attain the union of all the parts of the being that we need to ensemble into one in order for us to become uh, uh, self-realized. Moses, as we explain in different lectures, explains the generation of these archetypes or souls, part of the soul, part of the spirit that we need to develop through the book of Genesis. That's why Bereshit or the book of Genesis explains in detail the way in which we had to generate When you read the book of Genesis, you find in different places the generations, beginning with God, as we explain in Bereshit, Genesis, how he, through the forces of the unknowable, divine, generates the different monads and how the cosmo creators generate within those uh, monads 
or sparks from the absolute, what we call the innermost, the spirit, what the Bible in Genesis call the Ruach Elohim, or the spirit of the Elohim, that each one of us has within. In many lectures, we explained that this spirit of Elohim, the Ruach, is Hesed, which is precisely the fourth Sephirah, or the tenth Sephirah of the Tree of Life. <coughs> and we also explained that Hesed is Abraham, according to the archetypes, symbols, written by Moses. We said that each one of us has his own particular Abraham within. And that is related, of course, with Hesed. So, from that point of view, we understand why unto Abraham were made the promises and to his generations which we know relates, of course, to all of those archetypes that the Elohim that we synthesize in the second graphic as Ha-Shamim. We explained that Shem, which is written with letter Shin and Mem, means name. Hashem, the name. And of course, in the Zohar, they say, when they talk about the heavens, that is, Shamayim, or Shamim, they're talking about Jacob, which is in the center of the tree of life, which we call Israel. Because it refers to the archetypes, to the 12 tribes. Of course, we understand that the ending of the word I am, Mim, Shamayim, is masculine. And that's why when we refer to the masculine aspect of those uh, names or archetypes that emanate from the Absolute, we said Shamim. Shem, Shemim. And this is something that escapes when you don't know Kabbalah, when you are not an initiate. Because if you find or you want the explanation of Shamim or Shamayim, it means heaven. But in that word is hidden many mysteries. And we explained in the previous lecture, Shamim or Shamayim means the plural of the names in masculine. When those names go down according to the way of creation through Chesed, because God, the Elohim, place The archetypes under the jurisdiction of Abraham, because he has to engender them into matter. And this is precisely what we have to understand. That the innermost, the spirit, our own particular monad, which is a child of any of the Elohim, places the archetypes in the matter through the initiation. This is how we see it and how it is. That's why the book of Genesis states in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth, Haaretz in Hebrew, is a word that continues after Shamayim that we were explaining in the previous lecture. And then after that states in the earth was 
formless and void. This earth that was formless, formless and void is a matter which is always feminine in which in the tree of life is explained in many ways but refers to Malkut which is the very end of the way of creation where we find this three-dimensional world nature, matter and that's why when the archetypes penetrate into matter into what we say in Kabbalah, Ma, because above the archetypes are within me. That me is masculine, but Ma is feminine. And that's why the archetypes, when they are inside the matter, they are not called Shamim, but Shemat. Because the end of the word Shem with the letter Tav is feminine. This is how it is in Hebrew. When you say Shemat, that means the names. But in feminine plural. And this is how you see it when you study the book of Genesis. Above is masculine, Shemim. Below is feminine, Shemot. And are the same. The archetypes in heaven, the archetypes in earth. Which are generated by the absolute in order to acquire self-realization, the development in the universe. But in order for these archetypes to acquire development <coughs> in the universe, they need a guidance, a tutor, which are the cosmo creators that did that work in past cosmic days. And therefore, they are capable of guiding the new monads that appear from the Absolute. And that's why we explained that the Cosmo Creators, which we call the Elohim, place that tutor in every spark that came from the Absolute. And this is what we call the innermost. This is what we call Abraham, Chesed, in the Bible, Kabbalistically speaking. That's why you find in the book of Genesis that unto Abraham were made the promises and unto his generations. Because this Abraham, this Chesed innermost, has first to generate But remember that Abraham has the attributes of the Cosmo Creators and at the same time is connected to the Absolute because it came from the spark. This is precisely the way in which we have to understand why the word Elohim pertains to the Absolute and also to the Cosmo Creators. So in this way, we have to understand that each one of us has their own mystery. In order to attain the self-realization of the being, you do it through Hesed, the innermost, the monad. But each monad has its own mystery. <coughs> you cannot do it in the same way that other monad did it. The other monads, which are self-realized, guide the new monads into this self-realization. But each one has to develop their own archetypes in their own manner. 
because each one has, has its own mystery. There is not uh, equality in the universe. There's always difference. The gods are different. He watch has his own will. And when we said will, has his own Moses. Of course, the great master Moses that came a long time ago came in order to deliver that. And that's why the book of Genesis explains in detail how this generation of these archetypes is performed through initiations to those that follow the indications that we are, of course, giving in these lectures little by little. Because humanity needs it. Unfortunately, humanity has not the knowledge of Kabbalah. So we have to explain in different lectures, different manners, to finally understand. When Abraham comes from the city of Ur, remember that Ur is or light, meaning comes from the absolute. Because all the cosmo creators also comes from the absolute. So this has said is the innermost which connects us to our own particular Glorian. Because the Glorian is that part that is a ray that connects us to the absolute. We need to develop that Glorian. But that Glorian cannot develop, it is not for has said the innermost that the cosmocators put there in order for the Glorian to become self-realized. So our innermost is the bridge to our Glorian. And the innermost are the mysteries that the cosmo creators give us in order for us to do what we have to do. <coughs> so you behold there all the mysteries. That's why the Cosmo creators are related with Genesis, which in Kabbalah is called Bria, the wall of creation. Because to the wall of creation is how they work. And the wall of creation is controlled by the second sephira of the first triangle of the tree of life, which is called Chochmah. Wisdom. And then in Christianity it is called the sun. So that's why in the Sohar states that Hesed receives the attributes from Chochmah, which is wisdom. The Christ, the sun. It's true. Because Chochmah, the second sephira, is in charge of the world of Bria. The world of Genesis the world of generation, because he receives the archetypes through Keter, the Glorian. In the previous lecture, we explained that Chokhmah is the letter Vav, the sun, that is related with Vat Haaretz, that to this Vav enter the archetypes into the earth. Vav is the letter that means and in Hebrew. So here you find why the letter Shin relates to the letter Vav. And why the letter Shin, if you observe it in the second graphic, has three Vavs. Because these three Vavs are related with the second triangle. Which in many lectures we said is Abraham... Isaac and Jacob. Those are the three archetypes related with the monad that we have that work through initiations in us in order to put that shin into activity. But look, the shin is in relation with chokmah, is in relation with what we call the cosmo creators because they are the tutors. That are guiding. In other words, 
the absolute places all the archetypes in Chokhmah, which is the sun, Christ. The sun is UN. In order for this Christ to do what he has to do in the matter, but when it enters into the matter, the archetypes are disorderly. That's why you find that the first verse of the book of Shemot, which is called Exodus, is, and these are the names of the children of Israel who came into disharmony. The word that is written in that first verse is Matsarima. Remember that in Hebrew, Matsarim, Mitzrahim, is Egypt. I see, this is how it is translated. But uh, the first verse of Genesis has the he at the end of this word. It's completely different. That means disharmony. So it means that these are the names, or these are the names where they could call Shamim of heaven that enter into the earth and are in disharmony. This is how we have them. Because we are the earth. We have them in this harmony. These 12 archetypes that we are talking about here relate to Chokhmah. <coughs> because Chokhmah, astrologically speaking, is related to the zodiac, the 12 zodiacal signs, where you find the Elohim, the Cosmo Creators. This Chokhmah has all the attributes of the universe there, in the zodiac. The 12 tribes. This is how they are synthesized, or the 12 zodiacal signs, which are related to the 12 tribes of Israel. So you see how easy it is to see it, in order for us to understand. And this is how the names, the archetypes, enter into the matter. And the first one that is starting the job to organize them is Abraham. Because Abraham comes from the Chaldeans, from the city of Ur, and go into Egypt. He's the first one that enters into Egypt, Mizraim. Why? Because in order for Hesed to start working with the archetypes, he has to enter into Malkut. Malkut is Mizrahim, the earth. This is the initiation of minor mysteries that all of us have to enter in because Mizrahim is related to Klippot. Why? Because Klippot, what we call hell or inferno, the nine inferior dimensions are inside Malkut. This is what we call our subconsciousness, infraconsciousness, unconsciousness. Where we find those parts of our consciousness, which are called archetypes, which are disorderly in disharmony. But when Abraham enters there, start organizing them, receiving initiations, and he first confronts, for the first time, the big crocodile, the great crocodile, which is called Farah, or the Pharaoh, which is the king of the physical world. This is our physicality. So then, it is written that when Abraham went to Egypt, he went with his wife, Sarai, who was a beautiful woman that is related, of course, with the Shekinah, the forces of the Divine Mother, or what we call the staff of Aaron. Just very hidden. 
And of course, Abraham, as many of us, when we enter into this path, we are afraid of many things. And this is how he confronts uh, uh, and says to his wife, don't say that you are my wife, I will say that you are my sister. Because when they see that you are pretty, they will kill me in order to get you. So then the Pharaoh sees this woman and get in love with her. And by knowing that he's a sister of Abraham, says, well, she can be my wife. We call the mysteries that the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, the big crocodile, wants those mysteries for him. But then when he discovered that he's the wife of Abraham, why? Because when God, the Elohim, discovered that the Pharaoh is trying to be the wife, I mean the husband of the wife of Abraham, and then Joel Haba says, I'm going to make this Pharaoh to understand that he shouldn't touch that woman. And for the first time, you read the book of Genesis, it's written there. God put the plagues in it. So when you find and you think, oh, the plagues are just related with Exodus. No, you find in Genesis how those, the Pharaoh received the plagues and then talks with Abraham and says, what did you tell me that was your wife? Here, God is punishing me because of you. Take your wife out of here with all your wealth and leave me alone. So Abraham leaves Egypt with a lot of riches into the land of Canaan, I believe. But before the Pharaoh receives the plagues. And this is very important to understand. Because all of us, when we enter into this path, we have to overcome the plagues, physically speaking, that we are talking about. It's not as People think that the plagues are only for those people that are already in mastery. No. The plagues are applied in different levels. According to our own particular uh, idiosyncrasy or level in which we are. You are single. You are not practicing sexual magic. But you have to be in chastity. <coughs> and then, this is how Abraham entered first. Because the first initiation of major mysteries that is attained by the innermost is explained when Abraham has his first son, which is called Isaac. Isaac. Which relates to Gebura. In the first initiation of major mysteries, all the powers that we get from Malkut, all the powers that we get from the Pharaoh, is absorbed by the monad into Geburah. This is how Geburah are united with Hesed. This is how you explain it and how you study when you study the, the, the life of Abraham with Isaac. Isaac and Abraham relates to the Superior parts of the monad, Hesed and Geburah. And of course, that is related with the first initiation of mere mysteries. When Abraham is generating, when the innermost is generating, beginning to generate. But before that, they had to pass. The or, uh, ordeals or, or, or nine mysteries, the mysteries of the initiation, minor mysteries, nine. Because indeed, the ten plagues that we read are related to Malkut. The first are the mysteries that we had to develop in relation with sexual alchemy, chastity. So, the first, uh, we will say, plague that is all over the world is fornication. That all of us fell into it because of ignorance. But from that comes other plagues. 
which the Bible call little wisdoms or knowledge that are acquired in Malkut that people think relates to God but does not relate to God. Are we place below let me show you uh, in one of the graphics that uh, if you search for it we name the nine uh, negative things that we had to avoid when we enter into this path. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 10 and 11, we find what we are uh, quoted there. Deuteronomy is called Devarim in relation with the tree of life. Devarim is in relation with the second triangle. Dabar, the word, because in the second triangle is when we incarnate the word of God. The first triangle, which is the triangle of magic, or in this case is the third in the bottom, is the first, which is called Netzach, Hod and Yesod, is related with the triangle of priesthood, or the way in which we had to work. That comes after Exodus, because all the book of Exodus or Shemot explains the exit of those archetypes from Malkut into the tree of life in different steps. This is how we have to understand it. But in order to overcome that, we have to follow this second law written by Moses called Deuteronomy in the chapter 18 states there must not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that uses sorcery <coughs> a hypnotizer or a fortune teller or a witch or a mythomaniac or a medium or an enchanter, or a necromancer. Those are the nine. But the first, before those nine, is you shall not fornicate. Because if you are fornicating, you cannot overcome the, those nine. So that's why it's not written there, because it's hidden. But the first step that we have to do is stop fornication. And after that, the next, when you enter into the mysteries, in different levels. Now you might question, what is this first? Anyone that makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire. When I say this, it's coming into my mind, Moloch. It is written that this demon, in ancient times, uh, people that were worshipping this idol were building a great bronze statue in which children were thrown into the fire in his honor. That statue was a big bull. And when we see this bull, we remember the Kerubim of Ezekiel. The bull or the ox relates to Geburah. And every Kabbalist know that. <coughs> and we know that from Geburah descends the force, the serpent, that is called Ida. Listen, this word Ida in Hebrew. When you read it or you write it with Yod, Dalet, Aleph, means arm, Aramaic, I guess. Because without Aleph, it's just 
Yad, which means arm or hand. Either way, in Hebrew. But with the Aleph at the end, Ida, it's Aramaic. Which means also the same. But the wonderful thing of this is that Ida corresponds to Sanskrit, to the left serpent in the tree of life. Because from Geburah descends the force of the serpent into Malkut. And in Malkut, we find the cow. Because if Engebura is the bull, in Malkut is the cow. This cow and this bull is written in the Bible many times in relation with sacrifices. That is very hidden. It relates to alchemy. Because in order for Gebura, which is the male force of God, to be united with the feminine force, which is Malkut, we need, of course, the forces of Ida. The serpent, Ida, which is falling in all of us. All the demons have that serpent developed and go into Malkut, from Malkut into Klipoth, hell in other words. So this demon Moloch was the one that was receiving sacrifices of children. And that's why in the conjuration of the seven or the wise Solomon we say, by the holy Elohim and by the names of the genii Casiel, Sehaltiel, Afiel, and Sarahiel, by command of Orifiel, depart from us, Moloch. We deny thee our children to devour. This is a very strong conjuration, sending out Moloch, which in this case is placing Gebura. Like a killer. Because Gebura has a power of killing. It relates to the commandment. You shall not kill. Moloch, of course, is the one that relates to war. People think, well, in ancient times, people were giving all the children to Moloch. In this day and age, we are in modern times. Nobody does that. Listen. In this day and age, when everybody is doing it more. Because Moloch relates to fire, to war. And unfortunately, a lot of people are sending their children to war. In any place. People love war here. Souls are sacrificed for that demon. That's why it's very powerful. And people ignore this. And at first, it says there, you shall not give your son or daughter to pass through the fire. It comes into my mind this very moment also. Those Tibetans that pour oil into their bodies and then they light a match and burn alive. That is a sacrifice to Moloch. Wherever the justification for that type of sacrifice is stupid. And that's only a demon could be uh, agree with it. When people talk about Tibetans, they think that uh, everything is positive. No, there is black and white in all religions. All religions have the positive and negative. <coughs> so when you do that type of sacrifice or that type of immolation to burn yourself like that, you are literally doing to Moloch. That's why it's written, we deny thee our children to devour. This is a, a most obvious, but there are many wars among many religions. And when you sacrifice your children and then to fight the so-called between quotations, holy wars, that's for Moloch. Whatever justification we give is just for Moloch. And that's the first one. Because that's the vice that is very common in our societies, unfortunately. 
only if you enter into this, you have to inquire about in which way you are breaking this law. Utilizing the forces of Geburah, the forces of Samael, the god of war in the wrong way. Because the most difficult way, you know, the only way to deal with that force is by awakening. And of course the rest, I don't need to explain the rest because, you know, sorcery, hypnotism, fortune teller, witch, mythomaniacs, which are abundant in this day and age, mediums that are called channelers in this day and age, enchanters, necromancers, and all those black magicians that are, of course, utilizing the forces of the soul in their own way. This is what is called the maid servant in the Bible, in, in Kabbalah. The maid servant is a soul which is cheated by the forces of the Pharaoh, the forces of Metzarim in Malkut. And they think that by practicing this type of black magic, night parts of the magic, they are, they are going to, uh, uh, or they are working with God, beginning with the first. Those people that go and explode themselves in, in airplanes and different places because thinking that in that way they are going to heaven after that. With explosives in their bodies. They are giving their life, their souls to Moloch. Not to God. The unmerciful is peaceful. This is not war. Unless it's a war that you are going to do against yourself. That's different. So behold there, we are all of us battled into this materialistic world and we have to fight. That war is against us, against all the negative things that we have that only we can overcome through initiation. And this is precisely what we have to understand when we read this. Of course, remember that when Abraham enters into Egypt, he knows that all of this exists, all of this black magic exists in Egypt. But he's very cautious. He has to overcome it within himself and leaves Egypt alive. And after that, we have that the dissension of the archetypes continue. As you find in the second graphic, going into the second graphic again, because from Abraham and Geburah, which is Isaac, goes into Jacob. The inheritance goes into Jacob. You read that in the Bible, you find how Jacob start working and fighting against Geburah again, against Samael, and, and, and wins. And that fight is in Yesod, and the stone of Yesod. He conquers the second initiation of major mysteries. Because all the archetypes are there with a lot of strength, thanks to the righteous Jacob. Because he is in chastity. So then they enter into the third initiation of major ministries, with the Master Samael explains in his books uh, the seven words, which is related with Hod, which is related with Joseph. And then Joseph is already with the archetypes dealing there in the astral plane, the plane of dreams, where everybody goes when we fall asleep. And we find that Joseph is that archetype in us that is skillful in interpretation because he is not a lazy one. He's working in the third initiation and study the messages that he receives, Kabbalah, to receive. He received the Kabbalah from God and he explains the mysteries to the Pharaoh where in the physical world the intellectuals here we call that's another Pharaoh. When Joseph goes into Egypt, 
because his brothers sell him into Egypt, is precisely the way in which the forces of Hod has to go down and to develop as an astral body, which in this case is Benjamin, the astral solar part of Joseph, of that archetype. <coughs> and this is how, because there is a famine in Egypt or in all the lands, the archetypes go again into Mazarim, into Egypt, all of them. Because Joseph is already there, as we explain here. Every man and his household who came with Jacob. And we read it in the first verse of Exodus. And then they enter all the tribes of Israel, which are all the twelve forces of the Zodiac, into Matzraim, into Malkut. And all the souls, which is called Nefesh, all the forces that came from above, from Tifereth, into Mithraim, since Joseph is already there. I mean, that archetype that is developing in the third initiation of mere mysteries. So we go here, the second Pharaoh. First, the Pharaoh of Abraham, then the second Pharaoh. But this Pharaoh is, of course, favoring Joseph. And now, after that, appears Moses with another Pharaoh. Because it's certain that the Pharaoh that knew Joseph is dead. And now another Pharaoh takes place and Moses appears. So, in other words, when we read the book of Exodus or Shemot, we have to understand about the three Pharaohs. And I want to explain the grades, because these three fairs are three grades that we have to, to pass. In order to explain these three grades, let me show you the word vitriol, which is a Latin word, which is Visita interiora terrae rectificando invenies occultum lapidem. Translated into English means visit the interior of the earth. By rectification you will find the occult stone. Everybody that enters into this path had to follow that vitriol. Because no one can develop if he doesn't go inside the interior of the earth, Malkut. Because inside Malkut, the physical body, is our psyche. So are the archetypes. By rectification, we will develop those archetypes. But remember, step by step, minor initiations, major initiations, and higher levels. This is how we understand it, and how we have to see it. Mizrahima is precisely what we find here in this beautiful graphic. When you find the sun and the moon, which is the symbol of the father and mother, all the planets or archetypes or the lights, which are of course in Mizrahima, but disorderly in disharmony. All of the names are in disharmony. We have to organize them. And that is the beauty of the initiation. This is how Moses showed it. Then, that's why in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 and 4, it's written, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Who are those many? The archetypes. When we talk about the archetypes, we're talking about the souls. We're talking about the consciousness. Because the consciousness is divided into many archetypes. Those are the parts of the being that need to awake. It is written, Brahma sleeps. Brahma needs to awake. So then, 
many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that wise, that be wise, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. The firmament is Israel. All the parts of the being. And they that turn many to righteousness as they start forever and ever. That's a prophecy. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words. And seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and Gnosis shall be increased. You said, and knowledge shall be increased. Same thing. We are in these times. Gnosis, knowledge, that is increasing. Everybody is receiving this doctrine freely. And of course, if you take advantage of it, <coughs> you shall awake. Positively. But if you don't want it, you shall awake as well. But down there, to shame and everlasting contempt. That's a decision. Each one of us has to do it by his own will. That's why, in one of the axioms among the Gnostics, you find the following quotation. Whosoever called ye Telemites shall not commit an injustice as long as they comprehend the word with perfection. Because it contains exactly three degrees. The man who dwells within silence, the man who loves, and the vulgar man of the earth. What you want, what you will, that shall be the meaning of the word. Dilemma. It shall be up to you. The Hierophant, in this case, the Hierophant is Hesed, the innermost, our own particular monad. Observe three ordeals in one, and it may be given in three ways. The gross or vulgar must pass through the ordeal of fire. The evolved or educated are tried in the mind. And the lofty selected ones or chosen ones in the highest. Thus, ye have stars and stars, systems and systems, degrees and degrees. But let no one know well the other. This uh, quotation comes from Egypt, ancient Egypt. And is repeating. In this day and age, we have it. And of course, who is Telema? Telemites. Telema is Moses. Telema is the word that we use in Greek for willpower. That's why we the Gnostics say, say our motto is Telema. And when we said that, we said our motto is willpower. Or our motto is Moses. The synthesis of that willpower. Because that Moses is developing. First, very hidden in Abraham. Very hidden in Joseph when he enters into Egypt. And the third Pharaoh faces that Moses already. Because that initiate already created the mental solar body and the causal body. And that Moses is already an adult. That willpower has developed from Malkut to Tifereth. Even though that is what we call the vulgar men of the earth. Let me tell you about this in order for you to understand Telema Moses develops within us through three grades of initiation cold the man who dwells within silence the man who loves 
and the vulgar man of the earth. When we said man, we're talking about chesed within each one of us, in different levels. Then, the first grade, the vulgar man of the earth, relates to the mysteries of the first, second, and third chambers, or apprentice, devotee, and meditator. This is what all of us have in the different schools, in Gnosticism. Three chambers. When you enter into the lecture room, you are receiving the knowledge according to the one that is giving it. That's the first chamber. Second chamber is the devotee. If you observe, it's related with what the Bible calls Leviticus, in which you learn when you study the doctrine, observe the tree of life, and you will see that in the very bottom are three sephirah related with the triangle of magic, triangle of priesthood. From Malkut, you enter into that triangle, which is the beginning is Yasod. And then you enter into the first chamber, you learn the doctrine. Then to the second, and eventually the third, when you are a skillful meditator. The first grade, the vulgar man of the earth, teaches the Gnostic mysteries. The Gnostic symbol of the vulgar man of the earth is a pentagram, which is a symbol of the microcosmos, or small cosmos, small human being. The four lower extremities of the pentagram represent the four lower sephiroth, Netzah, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut, with the apex, which is the head, represented in the sephiroth Tifereth, depicted in the Sphinx as the one between its two paths, which means Telema, willpower. The fifth spiritual power of the Sphinx relates to the incarnation of the word the initiation of Tiferet. The pentagram is a symbol of the world made flesh, which is a function of the soul united with Christ in order to perform his divine will. The vulgar man of the earth has to conquer the four initiations of major mysteries of the Sphinx and to control the four bodies of sin, physical body, vital body, emotional body, and mental body. By means of Willpower, dilemma. Thus, attaining the incarnation of the word, the work of the vulgar men of the earth is to develop their human will from Malkut to Tifereth through Tantra, alchemy, in order to link his human will to Christ or divine will, which is precisely what all of us want to unite our will with the will of God. May thy will be one with mine, is what everybody wants. The incarnation of the Lord. Well, this is precisely what we have to do. Eliphaz Levi, great uh, Kabbalist, states, There are four indispensable conditions in order to attain the incarnation of the Logos. In other words, in order to attain the wisdom and power of Da'at. Gnosis, knowledge. Namely, an intelligence illuminated by esoteric study. I mean, we have to study. It's not just anything like that and fanatically doing things. We have to study Kabbalah. An intrepidity, and he said, an intrepidity which nothing can check. A will which cannot be broken and a prudence which nothing can corrupt and nothing intoxicate. To know, to dare, to will, to keep silence. Such are the four words of the one that enters into the triangle of magic, into the triangle of Gnosis, Yesod, Hod, Malkut. 
Behold the three forces, the three parts on every Gnostic school. Hod, devotee of the second chamber is necessary because we need to receive the strength of Chokhmah. That's why uh, uh, when we talk about the vulgar men of the earth, we're talking about us. Whether we are for first, second, or third chamber, we are vulgar men of the earth. Because in order to enter into the third or the second triangle of the tree of life, which is the triangle of ethics, we have to reach Tifereth. You see, Tifereth is the entrance into the second, from the bathroom to the top. What is the entrance into the triangle of magic? It's Yesod. Yesod is the entrance from Malkut to the triangle of the priesthood. Therefore, we have to be in chastity. If we are fornicators, we are wasting time. Right? It depends on us. Depends how we use our will. Many people enter into these studies, but they don't continue. Well, it's their will. This is why it is written, do what thou wilt, or do whatever you wish. That is the only law. But remember that you, ho you, you have to answer for all your deeds. Not to us, to your own God. After all, you have to answer. Before God, you will answer. Or whatever the, the masters of karma. What is what you did, your will? Well, I entered into the first chamber, but I didn't believe it. Okay, that's your will. I entered into the second chamber, but I didn't continue. Well, that's your will. We respect that. Because in this doctrine, nobody is forced. Only you for yourself. With your own telema, your own will. But... Many vulgar men enter into these studies. When I said men, I'm talking about any soul, woman or man, we just said human being. And uh, scarcely reach the first initiation if they are serious. But very rare are those. That reach the apex of the pentagram, which is the head. Where we find will, power in the pineal gland. United with the heart. As you see here in the, the graphic. The heart and the head have to be united. Mind and heart. So when you reach that. And for a blessing you receive the incarnation of the Lord. Because it's Tifereth, the one that received the initiation of Tifereth. Then you enter into the second grade. In which you have to accomplish this exodus in another level. <coughs> the second grade, the man who loves, concerns to the development of mastery or adepthood. Namely, Adeptus Minor, Adeptus Mayor, and Adeptus Exemptus. The one that is without karma. When you reach the top of that triangle, is where your karma is forgiven. You are at the level when you don't have ego. Related to Malkut. You are a being. That is developed in the triangle of ethics. And those ethics have nothing to do with the laws written in this physical world. If you see the ethics is in relation with Shin. With your monad. With your own particular spirit. And you receive your own law. Your own commandments from your own being. Does can contradict sometimes the laws written in the physical world. But you have to follow your own mystery. But that is only for adeptus. Those that reach the fifth initiation of major mysteries. 
and that enter into that triangle. The goal of the second order, the lovers, is to incarnate in their human nature all the attributes of Atman Buddhi. It concentrates and extends in the triangle of ethics through different degrees. The Gnostic symbol of the lovers is Ogebura uh, and uh, Tifereth. It's a six-pointed star, the holy hexagram, the star of David which is a symbol of the union of the twin souls. The star of David also indicates the union of Tifereth and Malkut, the opposites in alchemy. The final outcome of this holy union is the philosophical stone. When, of course, we are working very hard, we descend into Malkut because Tifereth which is already the fifth initiation of Mayor Mysteries, is a master that he sends into Malkut again in order to work in the higher levels of this exodus that we are explaining here with all these plagues that we were explaining in the previous lecture. So, the way in which the Adeptus, the master, work in his own exodus is different to the one that works in the vulgar man of the earth, the first grade. Remember that we always have to deal with three pharaohs, or pharaohs, as we said. Three steps, because we have three brains. The man who loves is in relation with the lover. Remember the sixth arcanum of the tarot, the lovers. It relates to Tiferet. In that state, of course, we have to work with the Gebura. Because when somebody reaches Tiferet, incarnates his human soul. But he has to incarnate Gebura and Chesed, and that's a great work. It's just an Adeptus Minor, the one that reaches the initiation of Tifereth Mastery, is an Adeptus Minor. He has to work very hard in order to be an Adeptus Major, and after that, an Adeptus Exemptus. This is import important to know. In order for those people that are working in the vulgar men of the earth, the first grade, related with first, second, and third chamber, do not mistake works. Do not start advising people to do works that they are not capable of doing it. Because we had to awake, we had to build first things. And this is precisely how uh, we do it. Through the alchemical work, the lovers, Tifereth and Malkut, make light from their darkness. They develop their own particular knowledge and wisdom from their own monad, Hesed and Gebura, within themselves. Namely, the power to combat, Gebura, the power to love, Kedula which is to perfect or to be perfect in the flesh as their father who is in heaven is perfect. So that is the step in which we have to work very hard and to be perfect in this flesh here in the physical world as our father who is in heaven is perfect. So don't be discouraged because being in the level that you are, you are imperfect. Because that perfection is attained only when you enter into the second triangle. After passing all the initiations of the first or lower triangle, the tree of life. 
This is a psychological process. Now let us talk about the third grade, which is the man who dwells in silence. Silence is a virtue of Bina, the Holy Spirit, the third sephirah or the first triangle. Only those that are adeptus acceptus can enter into that triangle. It's obvious. Because you cannot be entered like, like a, the vulgar man of the earth. Some uh, instructors are always advising, performing works of the man who dwells in silence to those neophytes that are entering. That's absurd. Because you have to be without ego. In order to do the work of the man who dwells in silence. Or in other words, the man who dwells in Bina, the Holy Spirit. This is, of course, related with the Logoic Triangle. In which the initiate is reaching the levels of Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, in Dharmakaya. Those are the levels of the triangle of the Logos, the first triangle. Moses, of course, explains that as a book of numbers. Because at that, at that level, all the numbers of the archetypes are self realized and perfecting themselves. If you observe the tree of life, the book of Numbers is in relation with the first triangle. The book of Deuteronomy is in relation with the second triangle. And Leviticus is in relation with the third triangle, the tree of life. While Malkut is in relation with Exodus, with Shemath. Because from there we have to take everything to the higher levels. From Malkut we take energy. From Malkut we take all the archetypes. Without Malkut, we cannot do anything. Hmm? Misrahim. On Misrahima. So then, these degrees relate to the first triangle of the tree of life. The Gnostic symbol of those uh, uh, who dwell in the silence is the eptagram. In other words, the lamp with seven horns. Those bodhisattvas who have given their life's blood to humanity. The heptagram indicates the seven bodies of gold. The Merkara, the Egyptian Sahu. Horus, the highest form of existence. The complete ful fulfillment of vitriol. When somebody reaches that level, has reached vitriol completely. means visited the interior of the earth and achieved to take everything from there. Is done. The goal of the man who dwells within silence is to become an absolute man. In other words, to go beyond the first triangle into what we call the 11, 12, and 13 eons. Ein Sof Or, Ein Sof, and Ein. When you are at that level, which is precisely the level in which the Master Samael was at that time. It was a very higher level. <clears throat> he was a Logos who can guide all of his disciples internally. A being that reaches that level of the man who dwells in silence and reaches the absolute man, can guide his disciples internally. Those who are waiting for the Master Samael on the earth to come physically, they're wasting their time. He is interested in your archetypes, not in your ego, not in your physicality. 
Why is going to somebody to come here and, and, and take all of these physical bodies into a certain place? All of those physical bodies are working in themselves, of course. But the logos, chokhmah, the letter shin, is interested in our archetypes, nor ego. He is not interested in into, into fanatics. That's why he works in different levels. And help them in their own particular exodus. The man that is that more in silence, that dwells in silence, his goal is to become a master of the universe. A paramartha satya. Those who reach that level of absolute men are in the 11, 12, and 13 years. Their goal is to reach the Paramartha Satya. Master Jesus of Nazareth reached that level. But below him, there are other levels. But all of them, in the absolute man level, can come internally and assist you if you gain the level in which they can assist you. And that's why they call the Exodus. When the Master Samael was questioned about the Exodus, he says, well, the one that is going to do that work is my inner being, my Father who is in heaven, and not this insignificant person that has no value. But people, Gnostics, do not read, do not study the doctrine. The man, to, the Master Samael on the earth is a logos, and dwells within and will assist those that are working seriously. Those that are complaining, those that w do not want to do it because they have other will, well, do what thou will. That is the only law. If you want to be assisted by a master and see the reality of him, if he's really the avatar, if he's really the logos, the archangel of Mars, well, let us work in ourselves. Because it's not by a lecture or by a book that you are going to understand this by, by developing in, internally. That's why uh, in the Zohar, if you see the graphic that follows after the Telemites, we have this uh, beautiful graphic in which you find the God Mars, <coughs> the God of Mars, Samael, with the lance in his hand, ready to throw it. Remember that Samael as an archetype dwells within each one of us. It's an archetype that everybody has. That's what our states, or better say, Samael says in the book of Sohar, this is how it's written, my entire domination is based on killing. And if I accept the law, the Torah, there will no longer be wars. My rule is over the planet Madim, Mars, that indicates spilling of blood. Behold, the word Madim is between the word Mim and the word Dam also is there, which means blood. And then so you can write the word Adam also there. In that word Madim. You find water, you find the man, you find blood. It is related with Geburah. Well, the rabbis of the Zohar said, and the secret of the matter is that all the ten plagues, the Holy One, blessed be He, perform, originated from the strong arm, Geburah. And this arm, Ida, is how written in Aramaic, because in Hebrew it's just Jod and Dalet, overpowered all the levels of their dominion in order to confuse them. They, did not, uh, they didn't know what to do. When the grace tried to do something, it became apparent to all that they could cannot, that they could do nothing. 
because of the strong arm, Geburah, that rested upon them. Well, the Zohar is telling us very clear that the one that did all the plagues is Geburah. Strength. Geburah is willpower. And that's why you find, if you observe all the graphics that we put there, and the second graphic says, sexual arousal begins in the central nervous system as the brain sends messages to the sexual organs along the nerves running through the spinal cord. This is what we are. This is what we call Mizrahim. Mizrahim. Our own physical body. In many lectures, we stated that the cerebrum spinal nervous system or the central nervous system is the throne of Chesed, the throne of Abraham, the throne of your innermost. So the innermost works through the central nervous system. This is the Ruach Elohim that works there. And behold, the central nervous system is floating on the cerebral spinal fluid. So if you want to uh, uh, inquire, where is my inner most right now in my physical body? Visualize your spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is that liquid upon which the innermost is floating above. It's easy to see. And of course, the brain, as we explained in other lectures, is a physical vehicle of the mind. Now you understand why Chesed, the innermost, has to work against the mind. The mind is a fair all. The pharaoh, that crocodile that we have here in the mind. To the initiation, we had to know him and had to battle, had to fight against it. And every in the initiation, any sexual arousal, as it is felt by the innermost. But if you fornicate, well, the innermost has nothing to do there. The inner moss walks on top of those waters upon the waters of Egypt. The waters of Mithraim, Egypt, are the sexual waters, are the semen. So when Yahweh says, talk to Aaron, who is Aaron? We state it. But Aaron is Chesed. Because Moses is willpower. So Aaron, which is Chesed, relates to Abraham. Aaron the priest. The innermost. Represented in the spinal column. How do you call the rod of Aaron? In the Bible is written in Hebrew. Mem, Tet, Hey. Moses is written Mem, Shin, Hey. So the only difference between Rod and Moses is the letter Tet, the letter Shin. If you put the letter Tet in the middle of Ma, which is the feminine waters, the sexual waters, and then you find Moses. But if you put the letter Tet, then you find the serpent, because let the death symbolizes the serpent. That's a symbol of the serpent. Let it with the nine arcanum. So behold, rod, matet, or mate. Somehow, this is how you pronounce in Hebrew. Mete. relates to the spinal column. Because Ma is water, and Tet is the serpent that rises. 
is that serpent that Moses talks about, the bronze or the brass serpent that rises in the spinal column. <coughs> and the white that does it is Aaron. In the story of Exodus, which is the same Abraham, which is the innermost, our own particular spirit, the Ruach Elohim. So, when you are aroused, sexually speaking, the brain, vehicle of the mind, interferes. Because there you find the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh. The filthy mouth of the ego. Because that's what it means fa-ra. Filthy mouth. Evil mouth. That mind is the one that has his evil will inside of us. That mind in the brain is the one that says, And why do I have to follow this chastity? Why do I have to do that? I don't know any God. I am an atheist. Is what the mind says. I never saw God. Does God exist? And when Will Power is in front of the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh says with his evil mouth, Farah, I don't know your God. I don't know Jehovah. Why I want to leave all the archetypes out of my power? I control them. I control them through three ways, says the Pharaoh. First, the firstborn of the behemoth, the first mouth, the first, the firstborn of the beasts, in other words. That behemoth, that power that we have in the sexual area, in our loins, that animal power that wants to fornicate, through that, the pharaoh controls us. The second is the firstborn of the Main, main servant that works behind the mills, the heart. And that is, of course, the soul slave of all of those type of knowledges that are taught here in this physical world. Sorcery, medianism, channeling, hypnotism. And everybody is identified with all of these dogmas, etc., with science, etc., that's the maid servant, the firstborn that is related with dogmas, beliefs. And the firstborn of the Pharaoh is the intellect. That's the one that controls up the top of the head. So those with these three powers is how the Pharaoh control our archetypes, our consciousness, our soul. In Malkut, because they send them to Klippoth, hell, to the infra dimensions. And that's why you find in this day and age a lot of dogmas, a lot of theories that feed that pharaoh. The firstborn of the pharaoh, the firstborn of the maid that is behind the mills, and the firstborn of the beasts. Look in the internet, the firstborn of the beasts has pornography everywhere. In order for the disciples to enjoy, sexually speaking, the lust. Behemoth has that in the internet. The Pharaoh says, if I don't control them by this sorcery, witchcraft, hypnotism, I will put the first child of the behemoth, the beasts, to control them. And most of this humanity is controlled by, by that... Uh, Firstborn of the beasts. But then, let us go into the next graphic. Where we find <coughs> Mizrahim, the sexual organs of the woman, they're very clear. And our own, that we explained already, is related with our spinal column. That's the staff or the rod of our own, the very serpent. And the yod, his phallus, 
Remember that we said that Yod, Hey, Bab, Hey means Yod, Phallus, Hey, Uterus, Bab, Men, Hey, Woman. So Yod, Hey, Bab, Hey, Phallus, Uterus, Men, Woman. That's the meaning of that holy name. So this is written. And Yod Haba or Yod Hebabhe spoke unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Take thy mate, you see the word there, the rod, your spinal column, and straight out thy yod. When you read that, you, you, you might think, Oh, well, stretch out your hand. But in Kabbalah, we know that yod means phallus. Stretch out. Your yad means have an erection and go upon the waters of Mizrahim, the woman. This is how the man enters. This is how Aaron enters into Egypt in order to control the Pharaoh. It is very clear when you know Kabbalah, when you know the mystery of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Very clear. You find, for instance, that Mizraim, the woman there, it is written in the parts of the Bible that says, that is the land with milk and honey. Honey relates to the sexual organs of the, of the woman. The force that she acquires and develops with what she eats in the digestive system and many other systems. And the milk with her breast is related with the endocrinal system. So the land that pours milk and honey is the woman. But in our physicality, the milk is the endocrinal system and the honey is the digestive system. So the land that poured honey and milk is our physicality. But in the sexual act, represents the woman. So when God says to Moses, to willpower, you have to tell Aaron, go into Egypt and put your rod, stretch your hand. That's a very sexual statement that only Kabbalists, alchemists can see clearly. A stretch your hand means your yad, because this is how it is written, or your arm. The only extremity that you can find protruded from the spinal column, that yad, is the phallus. There is no other. When you read literally, you, th you think that Aaron is taking physically a staff and putting that staff into uh, stretching his arm into the river and doing that marvelous plagues or magic that he's doing. But when you know how to read, you know that it's Moses. Willpower, the one that is guiding Aaron, which in this case also represents the mind, because it's the solar Christify mind. Because remember that Netzach is below Chesed. From Chokhmah, Chesed receives the powers, and Netzah, which is the mind, receives the powers from, from Chesed. So this is how you find it. Chokhmah, Chesed, Netzah, the column of the right, or the tree of life. And that's why we say, we say it, that uh, Aaron is in relation with the mind, is in relation with the Holy Spirit. And Moses, of course, is a willpower that is working there. Because without Moses, what can we do? If there is no willpower, then the forces of the Pharaoh, the crocodile, will take all the sexual energy out. Is what the people do. When they go into the sexual act, they put the yod inside the hay. But they don't control the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh controls them easily with behemoth. With the first they were the firstborn of the beasts, which is the behemoth that everybody has. And fornicates. 
Do you see that? Do you comprehend that? Study the graphic and see it because this is precisely what is important. That's why uh, in the next graphic you find a big crocodile and the verse of Ezekiel that says, Thus says Adonai Yochava, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, king of Mizrahim, the great crocodile that lies in the midst of his rivers, which had said, My river is my own, and I have made it for myself, because that crocodile controls the waters of Mizrahim, the sexual waters. This is where this uh, Leviathan is controlling the waters. They want to take my power. But Moses appear, or any initiative says, the Lord is against thee. And we are going to work against you. So below, when you see that crocodile, it says, Farah. <coughs> In Hebrew, that means bad breath. Oh, that crocodile has terrible breath. But means evil talk. Because the crocodile, the pharaoh, symbolizes the intellect. And through his firstborn, that intellect is talking against Moses and receiving every plague. And doesn't believe, and doesn't believe. But little by little, the initiate is developing and controlling his own matter. Which is without form and void. In Amos, we read again the same verse that says, Therefore, thus says Adonai of Chava, the adversary will surround you, your land, Strip your own, your own defenses and loot your palaces. That is the crocodile or the forces of sexuality in our physicality that does that. Here is where we are. Mizrahim is Malkut. This is something that uh, in the last lecture we left when we said that Satan came uh, for the presence of Yod Chava and smote Jav with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. And he said, we will continue. But obviously we are not continuing, but in the next lecture, because there still is more to say. We reached just, remember the last lecture? Tifereth. The half of it. But I said, it is necessary to explain more in order for us that to understand that to reach Tiferet is not easy. We have to confront two pharaohs before in order to confront the third pharaoh. Because Moses is confronting the third pharaoh. But remember that the one that confronts the second pharaoh is Joseph. When he goes into Egypt. Interpreting the dreams of the pharaoh. And the first one is Abraham. When the pharaoh received the first plagues. From him being in Egypt. So three steps. Three grades. That we have to understand. And to comprehend. And that is in relation with all of us. The Telemites. When somebody calls you a Telemite. Means somebody that knows this mystery. And is doing the work. For his own God. That's Telema. Telemite is not somebody there. That memorizes books. Or not a lot of Kabbalah. To be a Telemite is to use your will. For your own God. For your, for your own good. That's a telemite. And. Uh, above. <coughs> we put this. Uh, on the graphic. Where you find the brain. With uh, blue sparkles or rays. 
And when we found uh, uh, the quotation of the Bible, Genesis first, first uh, chapter, verse second. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss. And the Ruach Elohim hovered among the face of the waters. Hovered. That's why I put that there, that brain there, to show you that the cerebral spinal nervous system is the throne of the spirit, but it's not the spirit. When the spirit controls that central system, nervous system, then we are doing the work of God. But we have to remember God <clears throat> in order for him to work in that cerebral spinal nervous system. Because the cerebral spinal nervous system is floating in the cerebral spinal fluid. But we need to remember God in order for us to take over. Our own Chesed, our own Abraham, above. Because our earth is formless and void. And darkness was upon the face of the abyss. The abyss is our subconsciousness, unconsciousness, and infraconsciousness. Darkness is Chokhmah. Remember that. Chokhmah is always there upon the abyss, ready to help you. Chokhmah is wisdom. Chokhmah is Christ. And why is darkness? Because it's a type of light that we cannot see with the physical sight. That darkness is in us, upon us. When you find, you close your eyes, if you see only darkness, it's because you need to take the light from that darkness. The only one that can do that is the Ruach Elohim. And the Ruach Elohim hovered among the, upon the face of the waters. What waters? The cerebrum spinal fluid. Those are the waters upon which the Ruach Elohim is hovering, waiting for us to start the work. Because if he starts working, and that, that Ruach Elohim, which is Abraham, Abraham, which is our inner mosque, descends and touches the waters of Mizrahim, Egypt, our sexual waters, then the Elohim says, let there be light. And the light was. And then we see how that Ruach Elohim takes that light from the darkness, which is Chokhmah, which is Christ. So all of us are connected to Chokhmah in the way of darkness. And only by working with the Ruach Elohim is how we make light within that darkness. Because the Ruach Elohim, I repeat, Abraham, which is Chesed, is under Chokhmah. And Chokhmah is the sun, is Christ, is the darkness. So the Ruach Elohim is the only one that says, Chokhmah, I'm working here, give me light from your darkness. And he takes the light from the, light, from the darkness and make light in your mind, in your netzach, in your brain. You have questions? Yes. How does Farah relate to the extremely powerful mantra Faraon? Well, obviously the mantra Fa Ra On, if you see, is in relation with Fa, the not Fa, Ra, the solar force, which is precisely in the physical body. And in the sexual energy, Aum, On. So when you are said fa ra on, you are taking, stealing the forces of that crocodile. Because that fa ra controls the waters in your physicality. Then you said, I'm going to steal the fires from my own crocodile, which is commanding and controlling me since many lives and in this life. And I'm going to experience an astral projection. 
And then you pronounce fa ra on. If you see that, it's easy to see. Fa, the not fa, ra, the solar force, on, the sexual force. Do you are taking it? And by pronouncing the mantra, you steal the force of the crocodile, the fa ra, on. And then you go into the astral plane and experience, which is beyond its jurisdiction. Because Malkut is controlled by the Pharaoh. But you can go and inquire and say, oh, this is an astral world. And then in that way, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, will start seeing that you are trying to escape from its, uh, how you call it, pass of the crocodile, or thing they have legs, or its jaws, in other words. Yeah. yeah. If I need to strengthen the left side, which archetype, archetype should I study now? To strengthen the left side, which is the side of Gebura. Above Gebura is uh, Bina and Hod. That's the left side. That relates to the serpent that's it goes down. You see it very clear. Hod is Joseph. He goes into Egypt. What we have to do is to follow uh, the rules, uh, the commandments that uh, Moses left in the Devarim, the Trinomius. What is the first one? The left side is where you find Jehovah Elohim. Gebura Eloh. Uh, Elohim Gibor. And uh, in Hod is Elohim Sabaot, which means the, the army, the host of Elohim. Because Elohim Gibor means the strength of the gods. And above is, of course, Jolhe Babhe Elohim. The one that says, You should not have other Elohim before me. Because all the Idols that we build are related to the left side. Because this is why we find the word Elohim. You don't find the word Elohim, but only in the left side of the tree of life. Study that. Even in the word Yetzirah, the left side is called Beni Elohim. And it's written there that when the Beni Elohim look at the daughters of the Elohim that were beautiful, or the daughters of men, I mean, they took wives and fornicated. So the Beni Elohim are in Hod. So all the Elohim are in the left. So the best work is to concentrate in the right side. Because by concentrating in the right side, you concentrate and you strengthen the left. You deliver your left to the, to, to the right. In the right, you have Chesed, your innermost. You have the priesthood. Of Aaron, you become a devotee in order not to worship idols. But remember, not to worship idols doesn't mean not to have statues. People think, well, I don't have any statue in my home. No, it has nothing to do with that. Something psychological. You can have no statues in your home and be a big idol worshiper. Is there in relation with us? As I was telling you in the beginning, those that worship Moloch are the ones that send their children to the war. In the name of God, of course, they do it. In this day and age, everybody wants to make war. To conquer that because this land belongs to the, these people, or we want that land, whatever, because they are the evil ones and we are the good ones. Everybody is evil here, in the left. You want to do a holy war? To use Gebura in a positive manner? Well, battle against yourself, against your own pharaoh. That's a good thing. Not worship idols. Respect the initiates, the masters. Be grateful. But remember that first you have to love your God above all things. Your Elohim above, which is Jehovah Elohim, Binah. 
We had, yeah. Can you pronounce the mantra Faraon for them? Do you have another question? Yeah, that's actually that mantra is not Spanish mantra, but uh, it's an ancient mantra that is saying in Spanish "faraon," but comes from "fara," as you said, "faro" in Hebrew, which is just the meaning of the forces which are in the physical body. Do not fall into the mistake of believing that the faro that uh, the book of Genesis talk about is Ramses this or Ramses that? No. That has nothing to do with it. The whole Exodus, if you want to uh, write about history, then it's in relation with Atlantis. And all of this is, is, is esoteric knowledge that we have to understand. People love the Bible, study the Bible, but they enter into much confusion. And they start worshipping idols making of a country, of a town, of a people, idols. And they worship them. And they say, this is the chosen people. Nobody's chosen here. If you choose yourself, it's different. To do the work. To be a telemite. Uh, do you have another question? No more questions? Uh, hold on. Yeah. Well, it is obvious that when we enter into this path, ordeals are placed personally, internally. They put me a lot of tests. Sometimes I overcome them. Sometimes I fail. More often I fail. And then I wake, I said, oh, again. They put me ordeal again and I fail. Well, what I had to do? Well, I had to comprehend some of those demons that I have within in order to overcome this ordeal in order to conquer my archetype. Because only through the conquering of the ordeals is how you conquer your archetypes. To conquer an ordeal means to, have, to achieve comprehension of the way in which that archetype has to behave in your intellectual brain, in your emotional brain, in your motor, instinctual, sexual brain. If you comprehend the way in which that archetype that is in that ordeal is failing, if you understand that and you know how to behave in relation with your three brains, and then you are conquering your archetype. Remember, with patience, you will possess your soul. This is what Master Jesus said. Take souls out of the context and put archetypes. Same thing. Consciousness. This is a part that we have to conquer. We have to conquer the consciousness. Those archetypes that are placed there in order for us to develop what we have to develop. So if we fail, well... Remember, we are not the first one that failed, but we have to continue. Because I don't know any master that self-realized himself and never failed in any test. It's a lot, you know. Remember that the Pharaoh controls us very much. And that Pharaoh doesn't want to give his arm to twist, Right? Even though with all the marvel that Moses does in front of him. He says, get out of here, Moses. I don't let your people go. Your archetypes. Well, be patient. Because little by little, God is more powerful than that crocodile. If a person bring, brings me an ordeal, that's a, a plague? If a person brings you an ordeal, well, the ordeals always comes through people. 
through circumstances. Study the four ordeals of fire, water, air, and earth. They come through different ways. If somebody comes to you and insults you, and then you say, okay, this is an ordeal of fire, which is common to the vulgar man. I had to conquer my anger. And you have to do it, you know. And a woman is tempting you because is sexually attractive. Well, water. Do not be identified with that ending, narrate siren of the sea. Control it by controlling your own elementals inside of us. So, ordeals come from, from outside, inside. This is the temptation. And the one that does that work is Satan, which I believe we are going to continue in the next lecture. I just reach where we are going to start, and again, I don't know if the next lecture, maybe I want to say more things and we'll never pass. <laughs> but anyhow, thank you very much. The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.